advance and uh, is significant. And there is a, uh, a Hebrew uh, understanding of the word advance where it means to break forth and rush against an enemy, to plunder and strip a defeated enemy. And so, in a sense, that speaks into the church being able to dispossess um, uh, powers and principalities in the heavenlies. To break forth, we are not breaking forth nations, we have to break forth powers and principalities. In fact, Christ has already fulfilled this. According to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, the church must simply enforce it. We have to break forth and rush against the enemy in the heavenlies. That's advancing begins there. But also advancing carries a meaning in the New Testament of driving forward, of going forward, of making prog progress, of advancing and of increasing. And so that brings the idea of advancing righteousness as a missional reality in the earth as we preach the gospel. We have to advance the gospel in that sense, make progress, move from nation to nation, from people group to people group, preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In one sense, we have to dispossess powers and principalities in the heavenlies. In another sense, we have to actually missionally advance the preaching of righteousness in the nations. How are we to advance righteousness in the nations? How might we advance righteousness in the nations? Well, firstly, obviously by preaching the gospel. In Romans 1 verses 16 to 17, again, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jews or for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. If the gospel of the church is not revealing righteousness, then the church is in trouble. In the gospel, a righteousness from God must be revealed. The gospel must be about the revelation of the righteousness of God, of the fact that God has a standard that he wants us to align with, to come back to. So we are to advance righteousness firstly, firstly by preaching the gospel. You know, in Romans 10 verses 14 to 16, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And Paul is referring to Isaiah 52 verse 7. Um, in other words, prophets like Isaiah saw themselves as preachers of the gospel of the kingdom of God. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. In verse 16, Romans 14, but not all, all the Israelites accepted the good news for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Again, Paul referring to Isaiah in Isaiah 53 and verse 1. In other words, the preaching of the gospel is, is, a, is a mission that is evangelistic. We announce the gospel. But also, if Isaiah preached the gospel, then the preaching of the gospel is equally a prophetic mission. We have to bring nations to the awareness by way of prophetic ministry. We have to um, uh, pull their conscience out of darkness back into the realm of light by way of prophetic ministry. But also, the preaching of the gospel is an apostolic mission because Paul uh, as an apostle says, he's the herald of God. He's a messenger of God. And so, and so um, the, 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 this preaching of the gospel involves those, uh, those three anointings, um, you know, so to speak. Uh, the, the, the anointing of the evangelistic anointing, of announcing. The prophetic anointing of, of bringing uh, men and elevating men's conscience and consciousness back to the reality of God. And the apostolic um, uh, anointing of 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 being uh, uh, of moving from place to place as sent ones of God in a mission to establish God's righteousness in the earth. Very very important. So how do you advance righteousness by the preaching of the gospel first and foremost by the preaching of the gospel. How are we to advance the uh, the, 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 the the righteousness of God? Secondly. 
by witnessing the gospel. Not only must we preach the gospel, but we must also witness the gospel. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What is the duty of a witness? The duty of a witness is to bring to bear the evidence of whatever that is witnessing about. In other words, witnessing therefore speaks into the kind of life the church is living. And the way and the manner in which church is perceived by the nations of the world. We have to witness Christ. We have to bring Christ to, to light. Illuminate those around us by the incarnation, the process of not only preaching him, but of incarnating Jesus Christ. It's for that reason that the Bible says we are the righteousness of God. It really means that Christ has established the, a new order of human life in this last Adamic reality, the last Adamic order of human life, of nations. Church is, in fact, a collection of people groups, a human civilization of God that is established by Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what church is. Church is the righteousness of God. We therefore must witness Christ, bring to bear, bring the evidence of Jesus Christ to those around us. We witness about the Christ that we have encountered. We can only witness about the Christ that we have encountered. And we can only witness about the Christ who has been incarnated through us, who is alive. We cannot be witnessing about the Christ who is in the grave. He must be alive in our hearts, through our lives, and through our public life. That's so very, very important. Number three, how are we to advance righteousness? By discipling nations. Establishing churches that are centers of discipleship. May the 28 verses 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the earth. Now, of the ages, the end of of the ages. Now we see here that uh, 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 Christ is is really talking about the emphasis of discipleship. Matthew twenty eight in Matthew twenty eight in verses eighteen to twenty. Then Jesus came to them and said, "All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit." And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. This is God's plan. This is God's strategy. It is to establish uh, biblical churches that emphasize, that emphasize the process of discipleship. In other words, the duty of the church is not just to pastor as in um, uh, taking care of the needs, but to disciple, to take people on a journey of transformation, of spiritual transformation. Um, in, in, in concluding this very important subject, advancing God's or Christ's righteousness in the nations has five imperatives that I want to leave with you to think about. There's five, it has five imperatives. The first imperative is that in advancing righteousness in the nations, we are re-establishing the government of God in the earth. Remember, God judge, judges through righteousness. So when a, a foundation of righteousness has been laid in the earth, then we allow God to be able to, to be the judge in the midst of the nations. We are restoring and re-establishing the, the, you know, the reality of God governing over humankind. The imperative number two is that advancing righteousness in the nations confronts the spirit of lawlessness uh, that we see all around us. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9, God loves, or Jesus loves righteousness and he hates wickedness. And the word wickedness is the word lawlessness, the absence of the standard. The idea of men setting their own standard. God hates that. 
and he wants to bring mankind back to the reality of God. Imperative number three, advancing righteousness in the nations establishes shalom, the peace of God. In Isaiah 32 verses 1 and verse, uh, verses, verses 1, 16 and 18, it talks about the fruit of righteousness will be peace. The fruit of righteousness will be peace. There can be no shalom without righteousness. And nations are seeking shalom all across the earth. And even in the regions where we are seeing wars breaking out, men are seeking shalom. But there can be no shalom where there is no righteousness. In Isaiah 32 verses 1, 16 to 18. Advancing the righteousness of God in the nations will prepare the way for the return of the Lord, for the ultimate return of the Lord. You know, righteousness is the herald of the Lord. It prepares the way for his steps in Psalm 85 and verse 13. Righteousness is God's herald. It prepares the way for his steps. So if one want to prepare for the way for the return of the Lord, we've got to begin to advance righteousness. And imperative number five, advancing righteousness in the nations prepares the world for final judgment because God will judge the world in righteousness in Psalm 96 and verse 13 and also in Acts 17 and verse 31. For, so for these five reasons of reestablishing the government of God in the earth, of confronting the spirit of lawlessness, the spirit of the Antichrist, of lawlessness, of establishing shalom in the nations, there can be no sh uh, shalom without righteousness of preparing the way for the return of the Lord, of preparing the world for ultimate judgment, you and I have a duty to advance, to preach, to bring uh, to evidence, to bring the evidence of the reality of God's righteousness, of becoming God's righteousness in the earth, of preaching, of witnessing, of discipling across the nations of the earth, of advocating even as we play the, the role of the prophet in the midst of the nations, of evangelizing souls, because evangelist deals with souls, and prophets can advocate on that nation scale, whilst evangelists speak to men, to individual men, and challenge them to come and submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you to take on the mission of advancing Christ's righteousness in the nations. Start by looking into your surrounding, into your neighborhood, into your friends and family and neighbors. And let's begin to proclaim. Let's begin to raise the flag of righteousness in the midst of the nations of the earth. Thank you.